As in real life, armored support was an essential component of ground forces in the Star Wars universe. During the Clone Wars, both the Galactic Republic and the Confederacy of Independent Systems made extensive use of armored vehicles, ranging from small dwarf spider droids to colossal juggernaut tanks. But how did the Loyalists and Separatists use these fearsome war machines and which side used them better? In this video, we're going to be examining the armored tactics of both sides and determining which were superior. Attention, Sergeant on deck! Let's start with the Grand Army of the Republic. The Kaminoans designed the GAR to work according to a specific set of tactical approaches, and the vehicles they commissioned for the army were intended to function as a links in a greater chain. The formidable ATTE walkers were intended to be deployed via dropship alongside the first waves of infantry, serving as troop transports and mobile bastions for the clones to rally around. The first waves of ATTEs and clones would clear landing zones for Republic troop ships, which would deploy SPHAT mobile artillery, which would batter enemy emplacements into submission. According to this battle plan, Republic forces would attack in waves, which would never stop moving and would become successively stronger. ATTEs and SPHATs were crucial to this pattern. They would advance straight toward the enemy, bringing the full might of their forward firepower to bear, simultaneously supporting and guiding infantry. These tactics were used in the first Battle of Geonosis and the Battle of Munilinst, where they were incredibly effective. At Munilinst in particular, Republic armored tactics proved devastating to the CIS. Once the Republic established its landing zone outside of the Mun capital, they established long lines of SPHATs that absolutely obliterated everything in the ground troops' path. Of course, there were a lot of holes in this battle plan. It was extremely linear and predictable, not to mention highly susceptible to flanking attacks. The GAR had speeder cavalry to compensate, but it proved insufficient. Additionally, the Republic's reliance on heavy walkers ended up being a liability in some battles. In the Battle of Agama, for example, the heavy footfalls of ATTEs collapsed a crucial natural bridge and cut off Republic reinforcements, resulting in a Separatist victory. Over the course of the Clone Wars, the Republic made many alterations to this strategy and began working in new armored vehicles to patch up the holes in its formations. Very early in the war, it fixed the flanking problem by adopting a pair of light walker models, the experimental ATXT and the agile ATRT. These greatly strengthened the Republic wall of battle, allowing Republic armored units to more easily shrug off flanking attacks. The TX-120 fighter tank also helped patch this issue, while the implementation of the UTAT repulsor tank solved the problem of ATTEs not being able to traverse unstable terrain. Republic armor tactics in general evolved over the course of the war. Formations other than the traditional wall of death became common, often employing ATTEs in new and unorthodox ways. But the general philosophy behind Republic armored tactics remained the same, and the GAR continued to rely on overwhelming firepower and heavy armor, often at the cost of speed and mobility. Additions to the GAR, like the ATAP and ATOT, Prototypes of the AT-80 -AT and the Juggernaut tank all embraced the tactical philosophy of the ATTE, with some being even larger, even slower, and even more heavily armed. While the Grand Army of the Republic was designed as a singular unit, the CIS droid army was the exact opposite. It was cobbled together from a dozen formally distinct droid armies, giving it a wealth of different armored vehicles. The tricky thing about this, of course, was that all of these armored vehicles were designed for different tactical approaches. Synthesizing them into one coherent strategic philosophy was a massive headache that plagued the CIS for months, ending only when General Grievous assumed command and reorganized everything himself. The core of the CIS droid army was the Trade Federation droid army, which was designed around a similar tactical approach to the GAR. After deployment, AAT battle tanks would escort MTT and PAC troop transports into battle, with the MTTs supplying heavy armor and the AATs supplying heavy firepower. 
While the MTT wasn't all that heavily armed and the AAT was armored rather lightly, the two vehicles complemented each other nicely. Like ATTEs, MTTs were able to keep up a slow, steady advance, often using their heavy armor to quite literally plow through enemy fortifications. AATs would essentially dance around them, unleashing laser cannon fire and salvos of warheads while putting their high mobility to good use. This approach was much more flexible than the GAR's Armored Wall of Death, as the maneuverability of the AAT made this formation much less vulnerable to flanking. However, the CIS droid army didn't just use AATs and MTTs, and vehicles from other separatist factions were designed with different tactics in mind. The Corporate Alliance's NR N99 tank worked similarly to the AAT but was far less maneuverable, while the IGBC's Hailfire droids and GAT fighter tanks were designed to charge right into the thick of fighting at high speeds, spraying missiles everywhere. The Commerce Guild's spider droids were designed around a staggered approach, with smaller, more maneuverable dwarf spider droids leading and the more powerful homing spider droids following. Techno Union Crab Droids and Octoptara Droids followed a similar philosophy, but didn't work together nearly as well. The CIS tended to just pick and choose between these various approaches, but it did come up with a synthesized armored strategy, one built around the Trade Federation approach. MTTs, Octoptara Droids, and columns of Corporate Alliance snail tanks interchangeably served as the vanguard of armored units protected by more maneuverable AATs, GATs, and homing spider droids, and led by dwarf spider droids, crab droids, and STAPs. This basic approach was incredibly flexible and relied upon a diversity of vehicle types. While Republic armor tactics were firepower focused, Separatist tactics were more about maneuverability and overwhelming the enemy, be it through firepower, numbers, or sheer momentum. Both of these tactical approaches had their merits, at least within the grand scheme of the Clone Wars. We also mentioned how Republic armored tactics were effective at Mutalance and detrimental at Agamar, but they also played major roles, for better or worse, in a number of other major battles. Republic armor was crucial in the Battle of Kashyyyk and allowed the Republic to hold the line against the Separatist onslaught. Indeed, Republic armor played crucial roles in many battles during the Outer Rim sieges. During long engagements against entrenched separatist positions, the firepower-focused nature of Republic armored tactics allowed the GAR to whittle away at entrenched separatist forces while keeping them suppressed. However, there were also a number of other battles in which Republic armored tactics were a hindrance, or were just plain ineffective. Armored support did nothing for the Republic during the Battle of Prey Sitlin, where it was shredded by separatist artillery, and it was virtually non-existent in the Battle of Umbara, where the planet's dense jungles would have made mobility impossible for most Republic vehicles. Additionally, the Republic's reliance on heavy armored vehicles was an active detriment in the Battle of Jabim, where Republic AT-ATs, ATTEs, and ATXTs kept getting stuck in the planet's mud and were outmaneuvered repeatedly by the separatists. Separatist armored tactics didn't score the Confederacy all that many victories, but they were never a hindrance in the same way Republic tactics could be. The Separatist armored doctrine was much more flexible, allowing Separatist armored vehicles to operate smoothly on planets like Jabim and Felucia, where they practically drove circles around immobilized Republic walkers. As a whole, the Separatist approach was much more reliable, but it also wasn't as formidable as the Republic's tactics were at their best. The Confederacy's armored units were often outgunned by their Republic counterparts, as happened in Munilinst, and they could be highly susceptible to Republic fire, as was the case in the Battle of Christosis. There isn't an objective answer as to which of these strategic philosophies was better, but we would argue that, overall, the Confederacy's armored tactics were just a little bit better. This is because the Separatists' approach was just so much more flexible, and the armored vehicles it used were far more diverse. The majority of Republic armored vehicles filled roughly the same niche as the ATTE with small variations. Speed bikes, ATRTs, fighter tanks, and ATXTs were the only exceptions, and of those four, only one saw regular use. The Separatists, meanwhile, had nearly a dozen different primary armored vehicles, all with distinct mission profiles and capabilities. 
AATs, GATs, and homing spider droids may have all filled the same niche in separatist formations, but they were wildly different vehicles with different strengths and weaknesses, as was true for the other components of the typical separatist armored column. Adaptability is crucial on the battlefield, and CIS armored tactics were just more flexible. That's just our take, however. What do you think? Do you disagree with our analysis? Who do you think has the superior armored tactics, the Republic or the Separatists? Please let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.